history of labor? Well, this is probably the a key strike in labor history, the uh, Pullman strike of 1894, <clears throat> basically because there had been the uh, great upheaval of 1877, the closest thing we ever had to a workers' revolution. That's probably why Pullman got the idea of the company town, because he was on the Law and Order Committee here in Chicago. Uh, in 1877. He saw young boys running from site to site uh, telling workers to put down their tools. And earlier in 1873 he'd seen a town in England called Saltaire and uh, uh, built by Sir Titus Salt and he got the idea of maybe building a town where he could remove his workers totally from the evil influence of Chicago. Uh, the well, immigrant he means the taverns, the Right. Noisy and politics, the whole, you know, and even the churches. Foreign workers. Yeah, the right. foreign workers. Right. So uh, the idea of the town was uh, uh, tied to that. And then to use 500 acres for the town, but to surround it with a green belt so that that area would be totally empty and protected from this these new immigrant groups that came in. And he had rules, didn't he? I mean, oh, regarding yeah. free speech and no unions. They, and I mean, he no ran a tight ship. And uh, every time one group went on strike, uh, he would uh, fire them all, and then another group, uh, if they went on strike, he'd fire them so that one strike after another failed. And you couldn't own your property. No. You always had to pay no. rent, so you were subject to be thrown out. And uh, the bank, you had to cash your check there and so on. Now, uh, uh, another important thing is that the uh, world saw Pullman, the town of Pullman, during the World's Fair of 1893. It was Epcot. Epcot meaning experimental prototype community of tomorrow. And so uh, people came out on special trains and it was given a medal for the most perfect community. And people, uh, Pullman was an expert at public relations. And he pointed out that uh, these were white Anglo-Saxon Protestant workers in his town, uh, whereas in the strikes in the stockyards, the strikes at uh, McCormick Reaper, those were immigrants. And people saw these uh, workers uh, as sort of model workers. Why would they go on strike? So when people, after visited Pul visiting Pullman and all the PR he did about how good his employees were, they began to wonder, now, you know, what is, maybe something really is going on. Maybe this man isn't yeah. the ideal guy we thought he was. So when the, when the bad times came and the workers had their pay cut, right. then you had, and then you had this history of Pullman aside of labor foment. Right. And then uh, uh, people took sides. If you were with the workers, you wore a white ribbon on your lapel. And that white rib ribbons uh, were all over the country. Jane Addams and people like that took uh, the side of the workers. You know, the other interesting thing is that the mayor of Chicago then took the side well, of the he, workers. He had and the been Chicago fired Daily by News. Pullman. He had? had? Yes, he was fired yeah. by Pullman. But Pullman. you got to remember, John, Jane Adams, the, the mayor, the governor, everybody governor supported Oakdale the governor, came but they all right. supported him until the recession and the strike. Yeah. So uh, up until that yeah. time, they were all yeah. the social workers that had supported them. Right. Jane Adams was one of his uh, biggest proponents at yeah. that time. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you got to remember, and then all of a sudden, when he decides not to cut the rents uh, and the problems and that were existing... he cut the wages 25 to 54 percent. Exactly. Right. That's where we start having problems. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, I, but the point I want to make is that you have these local... You have Altgeld, the governor of Illinois, who... create. I mean, this, governors in those days didn't side with labor every afternoon. Well, did mayors, Altgeld right? was a little different. But that's what I'm saying. He was he elected was a, by the workers he was a in a secret person. ballot. Yeah. 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 Right. right. But... Uh, but the feds then moved in, didn't they? Yeah, federal government. He couldn't turn to the get the police through the mayor, because the mayor didn't like him. He couldn't get the uh, state militia through the governor, so he turned to Washington, D.C. And uh, the attorney general, who was one of his buddies. I just want to go back, though, for a minute. To take us back to the work that your foundation does. And for those who might be saying, well, this is, you know, I wish you guys luck. And you men and women luck, and I, uh, you know, and I, I guess we can't come down there now. I was going to plan on touring. You, you can still come down there and oh, tour, can't yeah, you? We still have the uh, Hotel Florence, which is a uh, museum and a restaurant. There's a visitor center down there. There's the architectural splendor of the community. I mean, this community ex uh, extends from 103rd to 115th. Cottage Grove to the expressway, and it's a large community. The, the Pullman factory only occupied about two blocks by one block in this area. So, and it was not an area that was being toured on a regular basis. People were pointing to it, saying, "Here was the uh, the clock tower. What happened in the clock tower? That's where the executive offices were located. Uh, all of the." 
draftsmanship for all of the railroad cars that were built not only here in Pullman, uh, in the Pullman neighborhood, but throughout all the, all the world and all the other Pullman factories. These cars were shipped. Uh, many of the cars were shipped throughout the world. Don't forget, we had Pullman cars in England. We had mm -hmm. them throughout all of Europe. And, and it was all originated here in Poland, but they developed other factories, too, throughout the it's world. A great, it's another one of those great stories. It reminds me of the gentleman who, who uh, in recent years, he, he died uh, a few years ago, but he couldn't get a pizza in London. He was transferred to London, and he missed <laughs> Chicago pizza. So he started his own oh, Chicago yeah. pizza. There, well, Mr. And they became big in London. Mr. Pullman experienced rail travel, trying to sleep on a train in the middle of the 19th century. It wasn't very comfortable, was it? No. I was in Rome in the Vatican, and uh, I came out to uh, uh, the, the church and looked across that big area where the, the Pope speaks, and people were holding signs, Pullman 1, Pullman 2, Pullman 3, Pullman 4. I didn't know what it was. It was some sort of uh, religious group from Yugoslavia, and that indicated the Pullman car that they were to return to oh, I see. and march back to the station. But I mean, those cars. So I couldn't even get away from Pullman and yeah, Rome. But I mean, those cars were. In, <laughs> what he did, Bill, were, they were immensely more comfortable, oh, were yeah, they not, yeah, than what right. you would have experienced right. when Mr. Pullman himself had to come and from New he York? Eventually, had 70% of the market. The other 30 was the Vanderbilt uh, cars. But uh, he, his cars were superior. So various companies used his cars. And then he didn't uh, sell the cars, he leased them. And so he was, all, and then when they were, there were slower times, they were brought back to the plant and rehabbed. Is it true that the put down of the Pullman strike in effect set the labor, I mean, we haven't mentioned Eugene Debs, did, it, did Debs. it put him back 20 years or put the labor movement back 20 years? Well, yes and no, but uh, it also, the investigation, there was a federal investigation, hearings and so on, and uh, people testified. And it's interesting that many of the points that were made that could have avoided that strike, uh, federal mediation, arbitration, uh, various other kinds of things that should have been done, uh, were not done until the 1930s under Roosevelt's New Deal. But they're all mentioned as possible solutions to prevent anything like that from happening again. And then the, tell me again, because I think some of us aren't clear, was there an aspect of a certain kind of labor union that well, Debs favored as opposed right. to... Uh, he favored industrial unionis uh, unionism versus trade unionism. Uh, a carpenter would be a trade unionist. He does one thing. But at Pullman, you had electricians, you had carpenters, you had steel workers, you had all kinds of different groups working. And if you had had separate unions for each of them, they would have not been effective. Yeah, and Bob, I was reading uh, in the wonderful book by uh, Donald Miller, uh, City of the Century, he was talking about the fact that, I mean, he, the Pullman's are described almost as, as a community as kind of Pleasantville, uh, the, <laughs> right, the, 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 yeah, the movie. Exactly. But he was saying that if you look closely, yeah. that there were any number of people who started to buy outside uh, properties, et cetera, sneak back in and work for Pullman, right but that everybody wasn't going along with great well, father, uh, well, white what, father what Pullman. About only about a third of the workers in the factory actually lived in Pullman. Other ones lived throughout the, in the Roseland neighborhood and in the Hegwish neighborhood in those areas too. So that's something always to remember. And you know, when the strike occurred and when and the recession and the strike occurred, those people in the outside areas, they never lowered their rents either. So all of this contributed to a lot of strife that was going but on at that point. there were two seniority lists, one for people who lived in the town and another one who lived outside the town. But he came to layoffs. He first laid off the people that lived outside the town because he was not getting rent money from those people. So he knew who these people oh, were. Oh yeah. They were they, although I understand there were, even in the early days, there were some blacks that were living secretly, right, so, right. even though they weren't supposed to be in the community, in some of the houses. Uh, Tim, uh, Samuelson, aside from those of us who might want to go back down and revisit Pullman, what about the Chicago Historical Society? I assume it is a repository of, for people who want to get deeper into the history of Chicago and this part of the history of Chicago. Right. We do have very extensive collections that deal with Pullman, the Pullman strike, a lot of the original materials, pamphlets from that time, also a very good photographic archive. So there are a number of good images taken of Pullman in its heyday when it was completed in the 1880s and show the buildings in their original form. I mean. It's even good, I think, with the case of the uh, clock tower building in the factory that burned. It's a well-documented building. And there were original drawings that exist mm. for it. There were drawings that were made after the fact to document the details and how it looked. 
And so from that, it's very uh, easy to reconstruct the exterior of this building. My wife is British, and when I was teaching school in England, uh, she had an uncle who had been an, a worker in, during the Second World War in Coventry. He would bicycle up to the top of a hill every morning, and his, uh, he would look down at the church spires of Coventry. This was so beautiful. And then, of course, one morning after the Blitz, when the Germans had bombed Coventry, everything was gone. But they've rebuilt Coventry. And I've heard someone on the TV today talking about he would look every morning out his window and he would see that tower. And uh, it, it was like a symbolism. Now, if, if they can do it in Coventry, we can do it here because that is a very important symbol, just like the water tower on Michigan Avenue. It's important to this city. Can you afford to rebuild? Well, I don't know with the help of this. Uh, today, I, I got to tell you, one of the first calls I received was from uh, Congressman Jackson. And Jesse Jackson Jr. has been a, a strong advocate of the preservation movement down in Pullman. And he said whatever help he can provide. Tom Dart, the local state legislator, has also pledged this support. Uh, the city has come forward to pledge support. I think with, with a partnership of the governmental entities and corporations and volunteers, we'll be able to rebuild that area and have a, a, a clean transportation museum that reflects history in this area. But if I had talked to you, let's say that we had just happened to talk, you know, say a week ago before we, before this fire and we knew anything about it, and I had said to you, how, you know, how are you doing and where are you with the state of Illinois and any other entities that you need to cooperate with on the development of that area and of your transportation museum? What would you have said? Well, uh, right then and there and even as of yesterday, the state was taking bids to look at stabilizing the uh, clock tower structure and the, and the plant itself. Uh, we, in fact, and we were going to begin the uh, stabilization effort this spring and summer. Uh, there was also, and in fact, we were going to close down the hotel for a couple few months starting ju uh, July 1st to begin rehabbing in the hotel the electrical systems throughout so the hotel. So you are going to do that. So That's all in the works. It's all in the works and we're pr everybody is proceeding full uh, steam ahead on those projects. Now, when, will the rehabbing of that hotel come during the top tourist visiting time of the summer or will you wait a little Well, we're going to try to work it out with everybody at this point so we can make sure that the people will see what the, the museum that exists in there at this point because uh, it, there is no top time in the terms of the tourism that comes is that down right? Here. Is it pretty evenly uh, right. spread out? Right. And the, and the area has, I mean, we have educational programs uh, uh, year-round at this point, almost one a month. We have the next uh, largest one we have is the Pullman Porter Contest, which in February that Bill's going to be uh, involved in, as a matter of fact, which accents the role of the Pullman Porter because uh, George M. Pullman hired over 5,000 uh, African Americans at the end of the Civil War to use as Pullman Porters. But that was very unusual. I mean, you know, somebody could say, well, he hired all those white Protestants to be his workers, but that was unusual, was it not? Right. And, you know, if you talk, and, and the other thing you got to remember, not only as we talk about history, uh, this area, Clarence Darrell gave one of his more famous speeches for the eight hour workday. Uh, we have from there, we have the, uh, the organization of, uh, the organizing of the Pullman Porters. Not right. really necessary in A. Philip Randolph, Randolph but right. really out of New York, but it affects this community right. more than anything else. And you look around and you see what, what happens here, and you're amazed at, at how this touches on all of history. Because Pullman died in 1897. Who was the first president after, of the Pullman Company after uh, uh, George M. Pullman? Right. Robert Todd Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah. Although uh, uh, it was said by A. Philip Randolph, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, and then his uh, son, Robert Todd Lincoln, made us slaves again as porters for the Pullman Company. And of course, they did not get organized uh, until 26 and weren't recognized, I think, until 30, 1935. 30, yeah. A lot a of people stroke. don't realize the right. role that A. Philip Randolph played. Right. People think, all oh, the civil rights movement started yeah. in the 50s no. or something, and A. Philip and, Randolph was and crucial Milton in Webster, the 30s, was he not? Chicago, Milton Webster, who was... Right the local person who did a great deal, and there's even a mural to him uh, just off of uh, uh, Stony Island. Right. Uh, Martin, no, it's on uh, 103rd, over 103rd. There. but it's a beautiful mural. Gentlemen, we'll uh, continue over the credits because I, uh, I see our time went very quickly, and it's up. Our many thanks to Bob Fioretti, uh, Tim Samuelson, and William Edelman for being with us this evening. The United States Supreme Court will hear oral arguments next week on a challenge to Chicago's anti-loitering ordinance designed to deter street gang activity. Was an appellate court right when it said that that ordinance smacked of a police state? That will be one of the questions my colleague Elizabeth Brackett will raise on Chicago tonight, tomorrow night at 7 and 11.30, and I hope you can be with us for that program. I'm John Calloway. Thank you, and good night. 
Do you do you favor a mall going in there? No, I don't think anybody really favors a mall. We don't need more malls. I mean, developers have tried to come into that area. It's a national historic site. How can so it's a non-conversation in that sense? I mean, you know, and we always already have a labor park in Lowell, Massachusetts. I was on a committee with Newberry to select ten other sites. Pullman is produced in Chicago.